But ultimately, if you are saying yes to different projects, it means that eventually you're going to be saying no to something else. Welcome back to the Faculty Factory Podcast. I'm Kim Skorupski. On today's Triple H, the Habits and Hacks from Hopkins episode, we have Dr. Shamima Sichter. Shamima, hello. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me, Kim. Shamima, tell everybody who you are and what you do here at Hopkins. Perfect. So I am an associate professor of ophthalmology at Hopkins. I'm a cornea and cataract specialist. And as an ophthalmologist, I spend most of my time doing cataract surgery and cornea transplants to help improve the lives of my patients. I also am really involved in surgical education. So I'm the director of our surgical training center called the Center of Excellence in Ophthalmology, Surgical um, Education and Training. And that center is located at the main hospital there in Baltimore. But my practice is actually based out in Bethesda. Mm. Oh boy, you're so you're what you you poor thing on on that um, on the highway every day dealing with that traffic. God bless you. How many how many days a week were you coming into uh, Baltimore from Bethesda? I end up coming to Baltimore about once a week, so I have two days of clinic and one day of surgery in Bethesda, and then I have two research days a week, Mondays and Fridays. And so typically, I try and coordinate all my meetings so that I can make one busy day in Baltimore, and that helps minimize the drive. Okay, so you said something, a word there that jumped out at me, coordinate. So what is kind of leading us into the Triple H series here, this Habits and Hacks, what kinds of practices, routines, habits, you know, things do you do that is, um, you think contribute to your success in academic medicine? I think it's a constant evolution. So I'm always trying to um, pick up new new habits as well. But I found that I'm a list maker. And so that has been sort of one of my go-to habits from a very early stage. And it really has been critical, I think, in helping me balance my work demands and my home demands and my personal needs and, and sort of bringing it all together. So I'm a huge fan of making a list. And so that sort of spills over to actually making maximum use of a calendar. And so generally, if it doesn't make its way onto my calendar as an actual event, then it's hard for me to set aside time for things. This includes going to the grocery store or, you know, running errands, in addition to making sure that all meetings that I need to have make make its way onto the calendar. So I'm, I'm really big into making lists and then uh, making sure that things stay as organized as possible on my calendar. Dr. Sichter, you are talking turkey to me. I am your sister list-making queen. I, too, love lists. I'm high J on the Myers-Briggs. I like a routine, a schedule, an agenda. Nothing gives me greater satisfaction than making a checklist and then going through it and crossing everything off and putting it, throwing it in the garbage. I feel so accomplished. And I think you're going to do a great service to folks out there who, you know, don't understand the nitty gritty of a list. So can you provide any insight into our friends and loved ones and colleagues who don't get the list nonsense? So they're like high P in the Myers-Briggs. They are more spontaneous. They look for opportunities. They may think that a list constrains them and prevents organic ideas from happening and exploring and just stumbling upon uh, new ways of doing things. So I think, again, and I'm, I'm trying to, I'm making this stuff up. I'm not really making it up, but <laughs> those folks who don't know list, when we say, when they hear us blabber on and on and on and get so excited about our list, they're kind of like, what is wrong with you? Because they think we're so militaristic in our life. Yeah, and so, maybe even a little boring. Yes. Yeah, I think list so, makers so, often, often have a bad rap of being boring people because we just love our routine so much. I think that first and foremost, I have to acknowledge, I wish sometimes I had a routine that was day in, day out exactly the same. But when you have surgery on your schedule or you're dealing with patients in clinic, you have to have some flexibility. And so what I find is I sometimes I feel like my mind is like a bucket and it's sort of filled to the brim. And sometimes when one drop gets added, I almost feel like two more fall out. And so as a means to just keep track, I really find it helpful to actually write things down. And so for me, a list isn't necessarily a um, law that I have to follow, but it's a means for me to organize my thoughts. And so I actually, um, looking at my desk right now, I have two lists that I'm looking at. So I have 
um, one blank piece of paper that I just ha- had the liberty of making an arrangement of sort of the research projects that I'm working on. And so that way, when I talk to my research fellows or my um, collaborators, I sort of have a sense of, you know, where we are on the different projects that we are working together on and just sort of keeping an eye on the big picture. And then I have another list of sort of things to do. So these are things that I might need to do for my clinical work, or for my research. And then I have another column of things, you know, that I need to actually read up on or um, errands that I need to run. And I just find that what happens with the list is it allows me to sort of create this opportunity to um, map out the things I need to do. So for example, if I have my list, and then usually what I like to do at the end of the day is just kind of open up my list and say, okay, I'm going to check in, kind of look at my inbox, see what's really a high priority and see if I need to physically write it on my list as an important thing to do. And then what I might do is actually, for example, for today, which is my research day, um, I finished my clinic last night, I took a look at my list. And I went through and I put numbers one, two, three, four, five on my list of maybe 20 things that are of different activities just to sort of say, hey, when I get to my office and I finally have answered any urgent emails or messages that have come up, these are the five things that I just want to accomplish over the course of the day. And to be told, sometimes I can hit all five. Sometimes I have to stop at three because other duties uh, call. But what I find is that a list is a means of organization. And if you feel like you want to be spontaneous and you don't want to schedule everything out, that's totally fine. But for me, because I have to coordinate with other people, my research colleagues, my patients, I have to have some organization. And then the other thing I want to point out is that I have a set of six-year-old twins. And so um, I love my twins dearly and they are so much fun. But it definitely has required a fair amount of organization to make sure that when I am in work mode in the office, in the clinic, in the OR, I get done what I need to get done and I make use of any dead time that I may have during the course of the day so that when I go home, I can put my phone away, I can leave my laptop closed and I can spend those few hours that I get with the kids before they're ready to go to bed, really being present with them. And I think that that has been really critical for me to be able to maintain my level of efficiency, having those delineated roles and delineated times for different activities. And I feel like my list is a liberation that allows me to do that because otherwise I'd just be sort of scratching my head all the time thinking that there's something I'm forgetting. That that is so perfectly stated. Um, I try to restrain myself. I tend to talk too much because I just get so excited when people talk and I just want to go and go and go and have a conversation. But can you tell people what happens if you always see things on your list that you never get to? So can you speak to this tendency that some of us have of perhaps putting blinders on and seeing that revise and resubmit that paper that's always at number 20 and you never seem to get it done. How do you, Shamima, prioritize and exercise discipline in doing the things that are on our list that we really don't want to do? So, um, yes, there are often those nagging items that you never seem to clear sometimes. And I think at some point you have to realize one of two things needs to happen. Either the next time you're sitting down to get work done, that item needs to be moved to the top of the list. And if you um, follow different sort of methodologies for organization and efficiency, there's this concept of eat the frog. So the thing that you're dreading the most, just get it done. And so either you make the commitment and you say, you know what, item number 20 needs to be item number one. And I just need to spend the two hours or three hours or whatever it takes to sort of get it off the ground and hopefully get it done. Or which I think is very difficult for many of us, especially those who are go-getters and want to achieve as much as we can, we have to say to ourselves or ask the question, is this really something that I want to do? Because the fact that I've been postponing it so much Mm. seems to indicate that it's not really a true passion. And sometimes you just have to say goodbye and you just put a line through that item and you move on. So obviously, if this is a responsibility that you have owed to someone else, you can't just walk away from that. But there are sometimes I think, you know, you have to listen to to what your your actions are telling you. And if, you know, you can't do everything and you can't do it always and you can't do it all at once. And sometimes we just have to figure for ourselves that, you know, our priorities change and some things on the list have to let go. Wow. That is profound. and. It's a tough pill to swallow, as you say, that especially in academic medicine, when we're trying to balance all these multiple missions 
of patient care and education and program building and research and generating scholarship and engaging in self-development. There's so many balls in there. And then, hey, let's throw on twins. Or, hey, let's throw on a global pandemic. How do you know this, <laughs> this, this grace and mercy showing ourselves, but also coupled with truth telling? I think it's so, it's so important because so many of us are used to multitasking or we think we multitask and we're, and we're so used to being acing everything and being so perfect and so hard driving and overachieving. And then at some point in a season of your life or a particular moment in time, it does take some hard soul searching to say, the coulda, woulda, shoulda. When I start hearing, I should, I should, I should, that's to me is my moment of saying, why do I keep shoulding myself? When someone tells me what you <laughs> should do, I always get like, wait a minute, what's the should thing? And that's when the soul searching comes in. And you're right that maybe you wanted to do that, or I wanted to do that, or thought it was a good idea. But the mere fact that it's lying fallow there is either a sign that I'm just being lazy. And like you said, suck it up and let's just chew on that frog. Or maybe I shouldn't be doing it or I don't want to do it. So either turf it to somebody else or let's reexamine our mission and where we're going in life. And I think it kind of goes back to how precious time is. I mean, time really ultimately is our most precious commodity. We hope that we use it well, that we support our health, our physical health, our mental health, uh, the relationships that we have with those with whom we're close. But ultimately, if you are saying yes to different projects, it means that eventually you're going to be saying no to something else. I think often we're quick to cancel out the things that are sort of self-serving, like making time for exercise or, you know, making time or once upon a time to get together with a friend for a cup of coffee. So now we're doing Zoom calls instead. And so ultimately, I think recognizing that there is a power in no, in, in saying no. I think for many, especially I, I think women in um, academic positions or women in professional positions, I think sometimes we feel obliged to offer an explanation. No, dot, 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 because no, you know, the next time. And, and I think we should be comfortable, of course, be polite as always, whenever an opportunity comes. But Sometimes no is a complete sentence, you know, uh, uh, this is just not something that I can do. So the answer is no. And, and we move on. I, I think there's a power. And I also think that it comes at a different stage when you're first beginning, you feel like, oh, my gosh, how how rude it would be to say no, I need to take every single opportunity that I can get. But I think in the end, you know, if you think about what your values are, what your mission is, and you sort of identify a mission statement, something that really drives you, and with each opportunity, you ask yourself, does it really feed into what I think my mission is? And if the answer is no, then, you know, it, it probably is not going to be the best use of your time, which is just so precious. Hmm. That, no, I just wrote that down. No is a complete sentence. <laughs> No is a complete sentence. Really? Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that's amazing. I, I, that is my, that's my lesson for the day. No is a complete sentence. Ooh. Perfect. Well, uh, Dr. Shamima Sichter, do you have anything else you'd like to share with the Faculty Factory podcast audience? Well, I, I think that sometimes when talking to junior faculty and trying to talk about work-life balance and how we, you know, want to do do it all, I sometimes make the point that yes, of course, we want to do it all and we want to do it well, but sometimes you can't do it all at the same time. And I think we have to be kind to ourselves to recognize not every week is going to be a week where you've eaten really well and you had time to do food prep and you made healthy choices when, you know, ordering from a menu and you had time to exercise and you had time to, you know, help your kids out with their art project and, you know, be, be a supportive spouse and mentor your medical student. And, and I think that it's okay to realize that one week you may have to sort of ease up a little bit on your exercise, but Give yourself a chance that maybe the next week will be better or one week where you say, you know, I just really have to prioritize being well. I need my solid eight hours to really replenish and I'm going to make that my number one goal and everything else that's always sort of hovering as a priority will slowly take its turn rising back up to the top. And I think if we can afford ourselves that kindness to recognize that we all have limits. And we're all in really challenging positions and the pandemic has only magnified that fact. 
that I think if we're kinder to ourselves, it, it will just make everything a lot easier. Oh, my gosh. Oh, you have no idea that is such an important message for me today. What wisdom. What wisdom. I love it. It's, when you said that, the perfect word, it made me realize, I and mean, you're giving those examples, that life is not a, it's not linear. So you just have to figure out where are your confidence bands. And as long as you have some relatively tight confidence bands, you don't have to walk that perfectly narrow, straight trend line. We're going to go off a couple feet here or there, but know that true north is somewhere in the middle, and the trend is to always come back to center and those little latitudes where we go off a little bit is our safety net, that we're okay. As long as we watch exactly. for those huge dips and peaks, that's kind of, to me, the right. red flag. Exactly. Wow. Hmm. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. Yeah, this has been wonderful. Folks, you've been, again, learning from Dr. Shamima Sichter. I hope you join us next time on the Faculty Factory Podcast. Bye, Shamima. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.